All right, good morning, everybody. New lesson topic. Amen. Yes, sir. We have the church phone books are completed. So, help yourself if you want a phone book. All right, we'll get started this morning. We need to have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for the, your word. Thank you, Lord, for giving it to us. God, I pray that you'd help us to understand your word, help us to teach your word. Lord, pray that you'd be with us this morning. God, pray that you'd enlighten and illuminate us, and Lord, that you'd uh, speak to us through your word, we pray. And Lord, we ask you these things in Christ's name, and for his sake we pray, and amen. All right, we want to study on how to understand the word of God, how to understand the Bible. So many people I talk to you say, well, I just can't understand the Bible. Uh, modern scholarship today, uh, when you ask people about the scripture and understanding the Bible, uh, they don't focus on understanding the word of God. Uh, most places when you consult people that are supposed to know about the Bible, uh, scholarships today's focus is not on understanding the Bible, but on finding the Bible. 99%, I will firmly stand on that. 99% of, quote, experts, uh, seminarians, Bible colleges, teachers, people on the Internet, uh, seminary-educated pastors, no, it's not everybody, but I'm saying 99% of them. Uh, they don't have the Word of God. They're looking for the Word of God. Why would I say that? Because here's what they believe. They believe that God inspired, holy men of God spake as they were moved. Somebody wrote it down and God inspired that and quit. So for those of us who didn't grow up speaking Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek, uh, you can't have an inspired Bible. Think about that for a minute. If you don't, as far as they're concerned, if you don't have the very papyri that, uh, or even better, the clay tablets or whatever that Moses had uh, there to write the first five books of Moses. If, if you ain't got that as far as they're concerned, well, you don't have inspired scripture. That's the view of scholarship today. That's the view of a lot of independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, quote, preachers. Uh, I just read a quote from John R. Rice, and that was what he believed. He believed that the, the, the originals only, the autographs they call them, were inspired. And people are scared to death to be labeled with, oh, you believe in double inspiration, do you? Well, I don't care what you call it. I believe that I've got a God-breathed Bible. If you don't, then why are you wasting your time? See, the whole concept with modern Bible translating is they are trying to reassemble the originals. And when they tell you, well, in the originals it said, they think, well, you know, we've made this much progress so far. We, we think that this particular Greek that we've assembled now, we think this is pretty close to what the original said. You know, we don't got the originals, but we think it's pretty close. Well, how awful would it be for you to get this close to getting into heaven? If you get this close to heaven, but you're not there, where does that leave you? You're still going to hell. So if you've got a Bible that might be this close, that's not anything 
assuring to stand on. And, and basically, the whole concept with modern scholarship today is you can go right back to the very first phrase that you hear the devil say in the Bible, and that is the concept of modern scholarship. Yea, hath God said? Do you have the word of God? Do you have the authority to base your life and your beliefs? Do you have something to build that on? Or are you searching to try to find the word of God and hoping that you've got the word of God and uh, looking for a better way to say it or a better translation or, or hoping that you've got the right manuscript? You either got it or you don't. It don't need improved. It doesn't need a new edition. Uh, you've got, or at least I'm going to teach that you've got the inspired Word of God, the inerrant, unalterable, every jot and every tittle you've got on your lap this morning or in your hand, or you've got a uh, 1769 edition of the 1611 King James Bible in your hand, then you have got the God-breathed, inspired Word of God. And if you don't, then go home. Pack it up. Watch football this morning. Do something a little more productive with your time because you're wasting your time. The arrogance of people, I do not comprehend at all how that, I just don't get it. You either are going to have to put your faith in that God preserved his word and you've got it here, or you're going to have to put your faith in scholars and what they tell you. It all comes down to faith one way or another. And I just assume to put my faith in that I've got the word of God. I've seen what this has accomplished. There is a testimony of what this has done. Have you noticed that in the years since they have been revising and altering the word of God, what has it done to the spirit of God? How has the world improved since 1880 when they come out with the, the first revised standard version of Westcott and Hort? How has... Christianity and spirituality improved since the new Bibles have come out. It hasn't. It's decreased. Modernism and rationalism has increased. And we are where we are today uh, because people have abandoned the authority of the Word of God and have replaced it with so-called science. So if you're going to understand the Bible, the first thing you're going to have to do is understand that you've got a Bible. If you don't understand you've got a Bible, why bother trying to understand it, amen? Why is it important to understand the Bible? Well, how else are you going to know God? Let's be honest. You have to have a manual of some kind. How many, you go out and buy something that requires you to assemble, whether a piece of furniture or uh, an electronic or an exercise equipment or something, you buy that, and what are you going to do if you don't have an instruction booklet with it? Now, some things you may be able to intuitively do and put together, and a lot of guys I know, that's their modus operandi. Heck with the instructions. We, I'm smart enough to do this. And then when you get done and you think, well, what's this hardware for? You got all this stuff left over. That's because you didn't know what you were doing. Uh, you just thought you knew what you were doing. God did not leave us without instructions. Especially in the day and age that we live in now. The, in the time, or if you remember from my illustration from the first lesson that we did, which uh, just to remind you, uh, the Bible was like a road atlas and you better know where you're at and which map you're supposed to be on if you're going to navigate with it. And where we are today, we have the complete copy of all of the instructions. So don't expect to get instructions from an audible voice from heaven or in a dream or in a vision because God's not operating like that anymore. You, you don't need that anymore. Everything God wanted you to know is right here. Now, if, if you don't believe that, then you're going to be in trouble because you can hear all kinds of voices. And if 
that was a sure means there wouldn't have been an instruction in the scripture for you to try the spirits because every spirit ain't of God. And how do you try the spirits? How can you know the spirits? Well, you have to know this. If you don't know this, then you have no basis on how you're trying the spirit. You wouldn't even know to try the spirits if you didn't have the word of God to instruct you in that. So it's important. The only way that you can know God's character, what God likes, what God dislikes, uh, what God thinks, uh, what God requires, uh, the only way you're going to know, you're not going to know that by intuition. You're not going to be born with that instruction in you. Even though we have a conscience and the law of God uh, written in your hearts, it's not specific and it's not a foundational thing. Man is fickle and your imagination and your emotions can sway you uh, and you need a foundation. You need something solid. You need something firm. Uh, you need an unmovable foundation to change, to, to stand on, to know what's going on. And God has given you that. Uh, that's how we know about God. How can you find out how to get to heaven? Well, there's thousands of religions today where people have come up with man's ideas or the devil's ideas. The devil's got a way to get to heaven. I mean, you can find all kinds of, quote, religions that um, worship but who do they worship? How do you know you're worshiping the right thing? Jesus told the woman at the well, the Samaritans, you worship, you know not what. God's got to be worshiped in spirit and in truth. If you ain't got truth, where are you going to get your truth? If this ain't truth, you don't have any truth. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? The word of God. That's the only truth that you got. I wouldn't trust anything else. I wouldn't trust a video. I wouldn't trust the news media. I wouldn't trust the newspaper. I wouldn't trust a book. I wouldn't trust a politician. I wouldn't trust a scientist because we have demonstrated that every last one of them are liars. And I wouldn't trust my heart because this says your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. You can lie to yourself. Didn't King Ahab do that? God sent a lying spirit, and Ahab basically lied to himself. Go up to Ramoth Gilead. You'll succeed. Yeah, right. Keep telling yourself that, Ahab. So how else are you going to commune with God? As we said, you know, the charismatics, they've got all kinds of communion with God. He speaks to them in visions and dreams just like he did the apostles. The apostles didn't have a complete 66-book word of God. They had scriptures, but they didn't have the finished item. They didn't have the last word, and God was still dealing on their road map. They were still dealing with dreams and visions and uh, words of knowledge and prophecy coming and God speaking through them. But that's not the way it is today. Now, the Holy Spirit can speak in your heart, but you better be able to discern that spirit and try that by what the Word of God says. The Holy Spirit is not going to lead you into unholiness. I have heard people say that the Lord led them to commit adultery with this person because, you know, God knew that they were more uh, fitting for one another than they had been for their original spouses. God didn't lead you to that. Are you kidding? Are you accusing God? God doesn't tempt any man to evil. God prohibited adultery. Why would the Spirit of God bring you into an adulterous relationship? Try the spirits. The Word of God would tell you that's contrary. Now, whether your heart or your feelings or your emotions led you that way, as we said before, this says your emotions will lie and your heart will lie. You've got a standard. So in commune with God to, to hear from God. It's got to filter through this. How else can you understand what you see and hear and feel all around you? How else are you going to know how you got here, why you're here, and what you should do? Those are three critical questions that people can't seem to figure out. How did we get here? Well... We don't know. We're just here. 
We don't know, but we, here's what we do know. God didn't do it. We can't really tell you what happened, but we know what didn't happen. We know God didn't bring us here <clears throat> because gods are not real. I mean, you know, science is things that you can test and experiment and demonstrate. Yeah, like something coming from nothing and life coming from nothing. Have you tested and demonstrated that? Uh, no. Well, we can't demonstrate. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is my faith is stupid, but your faith is smart. You've got a religion, just like I do. By faith, you believe God didn't do it. And it's interesting to me that there, when you look at things from a uh, bipolar, for lack of a better term, it's either God or Satan. It's either good or evil. You, there's only two choices. If you're not in one, you're in the other, right? Right? You're either male or female. Duh. <clears throat> if you're not serving God, then who are you serving? I got in trouble for that one time. Some, some folks got upset at me because their, I told them their lost loved ones were devil worshipers. Oh, no, no, no. Well, by default, I'm sorry. If you're not serving God... <laughs> Now, you may not be actively a Satanist, but by default, if you're not serving God, you're serving Satan. So if you don't believe that God created things, somebody had to. You, one of the main tenets of Satanism is taking the glory from God and giving it to the devil. And most heathen religions and most satanic, uh, most esoteric, most masonic all of those different tribes, what they teach is that Lucifer, the light bringer, the enlightener, that Lucifer assisted man and that God was mean and bad and kept things from man and that Lucifer brought enlightenment and technology to poor ignorant men that God had abandoned. They give the glory of creation to the devil. That puts you in the territory of Romans chapter 1, don't it? A reprobate mind because uh, you see the creation and instead of giving it to God, you, you give the glory of God to the images and the idols that you create. And God turns them over to a reprobate mind. You can't understand what's going on around you unless you understand the word of God. As a Christian... If you try to face the world and you try to understand the world with a carnal mindset, if your worldview is not anchored in this book, then you're going to be as mixed up as a termite and a yo-yo, which is about 99% of the population today. They have no anchor on anything, and anything that comes by, people just gobble it up. They swallow up lies and just eat it up because they're not anchored in the truth. <clears throat> Three years ago, we had a test. A test of the emergency Bible system. You remember back when we were in the Cold War and, you know, you would have the beep. This is only a test. Paula's or Julie's got a test going right now. <laughs> this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. The emergency Bible system test came out, and they said, you can't go to church because you're going to make somebody sick and die. You need to get our experimental, never been tried before, man is God shot that will fix you. <clears throat> and then you still might catch it and you still might spread it and so you still might be no point in taking the dumb thing. <clears throat> but because we were told to do so, if you didn't have a biblically anchored worldview to filter all of the information that you're getting through, then you follow the lie. Follow the science. Ain't that what they pushed? Science is what got us there. Um, Dr. Fauci and friends monkeying around with stuff God didn't intend nobody to fool with that got away from them. And then they want to 
shut down the worship of God. And do you realize that the church has not recovered from that? There are still churches shut down. People just said, oh, we're done. Lots of people failed because they found out they weren't anchored on anything. They just drifting. So everything that you see, everything that you hear, everything that you say, everything that you think needs to go through the filter of this right here to keep you online and to keep you understanding what you're going on. This is your interface. Anybody know what an interface, computer speaking is? Um, that, that is the, the thing that connects you. Uh, we're not able to communicate with a computer, so an interface is it's like a keyboard. You use a keyboard to interface with a computer. Uh, this, the Holy Spirit of God, your, your interface in a sense, this Word of God connects with that. The Lord Jesus Christ, your mediator, uh, but you wouldn't know about the Spirit of God and you wouldn't know about the Lord Jesus Christ if it wasn't for this book. Uh, so everything to do with spiritual matters has to be interfaced through this book. So it's important to understand what the Word of God says. So how do we understand the Bible? Number one, the most important thing to recognize when you're dealing with the Bible, it is supernatural. It is a supernatural book. It has a supernatural message. And it requires supernatural illumination to understand it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. <clears throat> so if you come to this study with an attitude of carnality, if you want to know the word of God so you can look smart, if you want to understand the Bible to impress people, or to, because you can win arguments or to just to pound your point of view uh, that don't work that way. This is not a, an, an academic process, although it is an academic process, but it is not an academic process. I'll speak out both sides of my mouth there. You have to come to the Word of God with understanding that you're not going to understand it with human logic. Human logic don't fit supernatural things. That's why it's called supernatural. That is that something, the very concept of this being the word of God, that's not carnal. Because if you apply human reasoning to that, to say that something that was spoken 4,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I wasn't there. My dad wasn't there. My grandfather wasn't there. My great-grandfather wasn't there. And as far as you want me to waste time going down the genealogy tree, you know, how far back can we go to say, you know, nobody you know that's alive, humanly, was there. And you have no scientific proof in a human naturalist sense that that happened and was wrote down 4,000 years ago, and I have the exact same story that hasn't been changed or altered in 4,000 years through all the copies and all of the history and all the disasters and all the things that come. Humanly speaking, looking at that would be like saying, that's pretty hard to, to believe. 
Now, we do have works of literature that have come down from way back that we still have. And it's funny to me that you really don't see the fight over those things. Euclid, Plato, Homer's epics. Why don't we have people fighting over the original of Homer's epic and saying, well, a better translation of that would be um, the lotus eaters there with the story of Ulysses. That, that A better translation of those would be poppies because, you know, the, the effect of poppies upon you, the uh, narcotic effect of poppies. Uh, I don't hear that in academic circles. It's like they don't have no problem accepting that this is what Homer wrote 3,000 years ago, but when it comes to saying this is what Moses wrote 4,000 years ago, oh, wait a minute. <sighs> so human logic and human understanding will always counteract the proper understanding in a lot of ways of the Word of God. To understand the Bible, you have to have the right attitude. Now, if it was just on academic knowledge, then the Orthodox Jewish yeshiva student would be a model of knowledge of Scripture. But you remember what Jesus said about them, or even, even Paul talked about ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that the scribes and Pharisees, by their traditions made the laws of God of none effect. They, if you want a lawyer, the best lawyer you can get, even a testimony of uh, the Saudi prince, the, the head of the Wahhabi Muslims, only gets Jewish lawyers because they're the best. And when it comes to debating matters of law in Orthodox circles with rabbis, they will go round and round in circles about goofy stuff. They will pick things apart and, and just from an academic point of view. They can tear the Old Testament apart and they can do this and that with it and they know all of the things about it. They can go to the numerology and they can tell you all the Hebrew word pictures and yet they can't find Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. <clears throat> So that tells you right away that your human academic understanding, uh, not many wise, not many noble are called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So you have to approach this in a supernatural manner. To understand the Bible, we must approach it reverently, understanding that it's higher than our intellect. And when we find something that seems wrong in the Bible, there's two paths to resolve it. So modern scholarship doesn't approach the Bible reverently. They approach it critically. That's where you get the term uh, scriptural criticism. Uh, not that they're criticizing the Bible, but they're picking it apart, whether or not it's true or it's the word of God. You're not going to get anywhere with God when you approach the Bible with a critical attitude. There is a reverence and understanding that this is the word of God. That is the biggest difference that I can point out between the translators of the King James Bible and the translators of modern scripture today. Modern translators have a critical attitude. They do not believe the word of God. And several folks that I looked at that were involved said they didn't think it was necessary for a Bible translator to believe that the word of this was the word of God. Because they're approaching it from a completely academic point of view. They have no reverence for it. They have no fear. If you don't believe what the Bible said in the book of Revelations, that if you add or take away that you're in trouble with God, then you ain't got no business messing with that. Just go translate Homer or something from the original Greek and leave the Bible alone. The men that translated this in 1611 uh, were reverently 
fearfully believing that the task that they had at hand was not an academic exercise, but it was a spiritual matter that required communion with God. And they did not come into that task with an academic mindset, but prayerfully and spiritually uh, they asked God to illuminate them and to help them. And they were interested in pleasing God and believed that God would deal with people uh, who monkeyed with the word of God. So if you want to approach understanding the Bible correctly, uh, you've got to understand it's supernatural. And two, you've got to approach it reverently. Uh, when your academic reasoning sees things that don't make human sense to you, what are you going to do? Are there things in here that do not make human sense? <laughs> oh, yeah. People say, well, there's contradictions in the Bible. That depends on how you're viewing and with what attitude and what spirit you got. If you read this from a attack attitude and you're just wanting to find fault, you'll find it. I can take you to places in here that I can't explain. But going back to where we had to start with, this is a matter of faith. It's a supernatural book. It's not a matter of uh, me. How do you deal with those? Number one, pray and ask God. James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. But give it to all men literally, liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You find something you don't understand? Ask God. Well, it don't hurt to ask somebody uh, if you've got somebody you've got confidence in, but, you know, I would recommend first, before you give up and, and ask a person, and I've always found this out, 99% of the time, if, if I ain't understanding it, I'll go to commentaries, they don't understand it. So I'll go, to, I'll go to the preacher and say, hey, what about this? And he says the same. I don't know. <laughs> We're not Superman. God, I mean, I'm not saying that people can't help you. I mean, the Ethiopian eunuch had somebody to help him. Philip. But ask God. God might send somebody without you asking that can, you know, give you some light on something. If you will pray and ask God to illuminate that, number one, if you find something wrong, ask God to reveal it to you. Number two, if you find something is wrong and you don't feel like God's revealed it to you, then here's what you do. I'm dumb and God's smart and just keep going. When you find a problem, if you can't find an explanation for it, then the academic answer would be, well, that's a, that's a problem. And the academic-minded, the carnal-minded Christian that's translating Scripture will say, we got to fix that. Well, that's a contradiction. We have to change this translation to get it fixed. No, you just best leave it alone. The problem you've got is you're assuming that you're smarter than God. And guess what? You ain't. When you, you cannot comprehend the intellect of God, you don't have enough life or brain cells to be able to even learn everything that we, in spite of, quote, the explosion of knowledge that we got today, we are still dumber than a box of rocks when it comes to understanding everything that God's done. There will never be a day when humanity can say, well, we figured out everything that God created. We have to start somewhere else. No. Nah. They only think they have learned things. It amazes me at how arrogant they are, and they'll make these announcements like, Oh, we've topped it out here. We're, you know, we, we got the lid on all of this, and we know all about it. And then you find out later on, somebody else comes along and says, Nah, you didn't. You got it wrong. That ain't the way it was. That's how science, quote, works. Somebody will test the theory and say, Eh, you're an idiot. You got it wrong. This is the right way. 
and for a while it'll be in your textbook. Don't eat eggs. Cholesterol is bad for you. It'll stop up your arteries and give you heart attacks. And somebody comes along and makes another test and said, ah, they're stupid. Eat all the eggs you want. It's not going to hurt your heart. It ain't got nothing to do with that. And of all the, you know, we're going to be destroyed by a nuclear winter or we're going to have the next ice age coming. We're all going to freeze to death and the glaciers are going to crawl across the continent. And then 10 years later, we're going to die of global warming. The ice caps are melting. We're all going to drown on the coast. That's the academic attitude of science. We know. Oh, sure you know, you idiot. If you don't filter what you know through the word of God, you're a moron. That's just plain and simple. Because God that created everything, every system, every action, every bit of biology, every bit of physics, all of the concepts of the laws of physics and nature that God brought from nothing. And you want to try to go, Job says, I repent in dust and ashes and you know, I abhor myself. When you look at what God can do and what you are, you're not even a speck of dirt. So if you find something in the Bible and you think, well, that's wrong, who's right? You or God? God's right and you're wrong. So you have to have the right attitude. You have to have the assistance of the Spirit of God. Then to number three, to understand what the Bible says, it must be put together correctly. It's like a desktop computer system. You got to have everything plugged in the back of the tire. Your keyboard's got to go here. Your mouse has got to go there. Uh, your speakers go in over here. You hook your printer in right here. Uh, you know, all of that stuff. It's got a place you got to plug it in right. You might have the best computer in the world. You might be the biggest geek out there and know everything about all of the electronic systems and be able to code and hack and all that stuff. But if you ain't got your monitor plugged in the right spot, duh, you ain't going to get anything done. You ain't got your mouse plugged in or your keyboard's not plugged in the right place. It's got to be hooked together right. The same thing with the instructions when you're putting something together. you got to have it put together correctly. Now, a lot of things that people mess up about doctrine and scripture and understanding of the word of God, they get wrong because they don't have it put together right. And how do you know how to do that? Well, the key to that is 2 Timothy 2.15. Study. There's where you get... One of the academic things, it's, there is an academic attitude to study. You have to apply your brain. God gave you a brain uh, to study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And the key, rightly dividing the word of God. You can study it, but if you don't rightly divide it, then your study will not amount to the correct thing. If you study the wrong thing in the wrong place, when you put together that piece of furniture that you bought, uh, you will note that in the instruction manual, uh, don't use the French, okay? And don't use the Chinese version. You find the one that's in English. Because <laughs> the French version ain't going to help you unless you speak French. You find the English version, and it'll say, number one. Now, if you go to put together your uh, new TV stand, and you start with number four, it ain't going to go good. You're going to have a wonky-looking TV stand. People are going to be saying, something ain't right with that. What's the deal here? Well, you didn't rightly divide your instructions. You started in the wrong place. You put your foot on the wrong place. You started in the wrong spot. You have to start with number one. Uh, it's built on a one, two, three, four. It's put together that way. That's how you put things together. So, rightly divided. Now, the Bible's one book, but it's also 66 books. And the necessity of correct division cannot be understated. 
which is one of the things that we're going to focus on in the series of this lesson. What do we mean by right divisions? Hmm. Well, here's one division, an easy one for you. Old Testament, New Testament. Now, for my friends that complain and fuss about dispensationalism, why is it that you don't have a problem with two dispensations, so to speak, and there's more than that. It's obvious when you read through there. But you don't mind dividing the Bible in Old Testament and New Testament, but if you do anything else, it's like anathema. Well, that's the basics of division. That's obvious. And what, what is the divining factor in that division? Time. There's a difference in time with these two books. Time has passed. You even have a, a period of time where that God did not speak or reveal anything. 400 years from the close of the prophet Malachi to the opening of the book of Matthew, 400 years of time in history that is not there. God was silent. Almost like he was establishing a division yeah. So one one way of division, the Old Testament, New Testament. Another way of dividing the Bible. Abstract and concrete. Or literal and figurative. If you can't figure that out, you can get in a mess. If you can't separate what is literal and what's figurative. Here, John 6, 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Literal or figurative? Figurative, right? Do you know not everybody believes that? Do you know there is a major worldwide denomination that accepts that as literal. Anybody know who that is? Roman Catholic Church. They teach that as literal. Now, you say, how in the world can you literally eat Jesus and drink his blood? Well, it requires a magic spell. You take these cheap cookies that are made in China and stand in front of the church and make this Latin incantation and God supernaturally turns that cookie into the literal flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ and turns that Mogan David into the literal blood of Jesus. Now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and I don't want to say the wrong thing, I think that the Catholics only pass out the cookies. They don't let everybody drink the wine. The Orthodox do, I, I think. So don't exactly quote me on it. I have to look that up. But as far as I remember, in the Mass, only the priests drink the wine. So you get the body, but you don't get the blood if you're a Catholic. <laughs> That's bad news. So understanding between the abstract and the literal, I can be critical. You need, you need to understand that. In verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Because people are misunderstanding. They're taking that literal. And Jesus didn't mean it literal. Does this offend you? <laughs> Third division that you need to understand. You need to understand the Old Testament, New Testament. You understand literal and figurative. Then you need to understand... Historical, prophetic, and poetic. Those are divisions. There are things in here that are relaying to you the passage of time and the events that took place in that passage of time. And that it's important. If you don't know your history, you're destined to repeat it. 
you don't understand, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because they didn't believe God and they didn't have faith to trust God. And God had to bring them through all of these things in their travel out of the, and left them in the wilderness 40 years because they doubted the word of God. That's literally happened and that history will be repeated according to the word of God. He's going to put them back in the wilderness so he can deal with them again. But anyway, you and I can look at that and understand uh, you better believe God and trust his word uh, in your Christian walk or you're going to be walking around in circles for 40 years and never get nowhere. So understanding the historic and then the prophetic. There are things in the book of Psalms that even though the book of Psalms is a poetic book along with the Song of Solomon uh, that is poetry, it praises God, but it, it has a poetic way that it's wrote. Uh, but there are things in there that you have to be able to understand and separate. This is not just poetic, but this is prophetic. Psalms 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus quotes that on the cross. The whole point of Psalms 22 is the prophecy of what he is suffering on the cross. And I'm not going to get done with these, evidently. <laughs> We're going to run out of time. Uh, okay, so let me bail out on us there. We'll keep discussing the divisions of the Word of God and how it can help us to understand the Word of God. All righty.